Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Freunde des Ambos Studientelegramms, Markus at home welcomes Dr. Astrid Weins in Boston, with whom we would like to discuss minimal change disease, focusing upon her fundamentally new approach to understand the pathophysiology of this subset of glomerulonephritis. Thanks, Astrid, for taking the time and for being our guest. My pleasure to be here. Astrid Weins is a renal pathologist and scientist at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School in Boston. She's senior author of an article published in December 2021 in Jason that many nephrologists consider last year's most important preclinical study in kidney disease. Perhaps you forgive me if I turn from my own words to the words of Joe Topf, who has recently hosted you on his NEFJC podcast and introduced your paper as an article that will literally change the textbooks and that will be referenced in textbooks for decades to come. And it seems to outdate last year's KDGO GN guidelines which stated that the pathogenesis of minimal change disease is unclear and that only biopsy allows its diagnosis. This is the first of a series of talks with global leaders in nephrology on glomerulonephritis, which follows our 2021 GN series. Last year, we discussed minimal change disease in German with Professor Benzig from Cologne. Now we switch to English. Dr. Weins actually comes from Germany, did her studies in Heidelberg and Munich, but she did all her academic work and clinical work in the States, and that we, therefore we decided to turn to English for this talk. And with this, I pass the mic to my co-moderators, Andreas Kronbichler, who is board member of the European Renal Association's Young Nephrologist Platform, and Markus Seemann, president of the Austrian Society of Nephrology. So this is basically um, what we are discussing today is um, your paper published in JSON and, and now in, in print uh, in the year 2022. And um, this urges us also to discuss that the current KDIGO guidelines for minimal change disease, FSGS, but also other diseases are already outdated in a way. Um, as, as Gunnar has alluded to, um, the pathogenesis of MCD is rather unclear so far, and there have been a lot of um, different observations, starting from a very important study in 1974 in the Lancet, um, showing a D cell um, uh, implication in the disease pathogenesis. But up to now, no real driving factor has been identified, although circulating factors clearly uh, were proposed to play a crucial role. And we know that, for instance, rituximab is somehow a wonder drug in minimal change disease, leading to a complete remission in most of the patients with so-called minimal change disease, or let's say mild photocytopathy. Um, in the last year, Astrid's team has published this groundbreaking article um, titled Discovery of Autoantibodies Targeting Nephrin. In minimal change disease supports a novel autoimmune ideology. The graphical abstract is given here, and I just would like to invite Astrid to guide us through the graphical abstract of the paper. And Marcus Gunn and I will um, just interrupt with some uh, questions um, for you. So basically, we set out to do um, this is basically an observational study. So it's not a clinical study, it's not a pure scientific uh, basic science paper. It is an observational study uh, using material from two independent patient cohorts. Um, both of those cohorts consist of patients with biopsy proven minimal change disease and active nephrotic syndrome. Um, and one cohort comes from our own institution and some of our collaborators institutions um, where we had biopsy material available for um, for our studies, as well as some serum samples on some of those patients. And then the other um, independent cohort is um, from the Nephrotic Syndrome Study Network, or Neptune, uh, which consists of uh, patients that are part of a longitudinal study network that has timed visits every few weeks or every few months where serum samples are collected 
um, and clinical data are collected from these patients. And we also used only patients that had a biopsy proven diagnosis of minimal change disease. Um, we basically uh, set out to study um, these patients for circulating antibodies against nephrine, um, as we had some initial evidence from our own biopsy cohort, um, where we suspected that um, antibodies, IgG antibodies against nephrine might be present in the tissue of these patients. So we really wanted to know whether those antibodies are also present in circulation in these patients. Um, we did this um, through different uh, methodologies. One, we built our own ELISA uh, for anti-nephrine antibodies and indirect ELISA um, using uh, the extracellular domain of uh, nephrine protein um, as a, uh, a target and the serum of the patients um, basically to, cap to be captured by that. Um, and then we also used um, immunoprecipitation technologies where we uh, we mixed serum with human glomerular extract, as well as serum with the extracellular domain of nephrine and ran that mixture um, over a protein G column, which binds um, IgG, human IgG, and then eluded that fraction and ran that on a Western blood and then probed with an anti-nephrine antibody. So different um, ways to look for uh, circulating anti-nephrine antibodies um, in the patient's serum or plasma. Um, we also undertook some immunofluorescence evaluation studies uh, where we used uh, renal biopsies um, of patients with biopsy-proven minimal change disease and evaluated them for presence of IgG um, that co-localizes with nephrine um, in the tissue using confocal microscopy techniques. And then we compared also uh, the presence of circulating nephrine autoantibodies um, pre- and post-treatment response, as well as correlated these antibodies with our immunofluorescence findings in the biopsy material. And then on the right, you can see some of the major results um, presented in this manuscript. Uh, one is that we found circulating nephrine autoantibodies in one third of patients from the Neptune study cohort. Um, and these antibodies correlated clearly with disease activity with antibodies being above the detect um, in patients with active nephrotic syndrome and in a subsequent sample taken at, in disease remission, those um, antibodies were no longer uh, det detectable. Um, and then we also, uh, found that nephrine autoantibodies are detectable in the serum of the patients as well as in the tissue itself um, and co-localized with nephrine um, along the um, cell-cell junctions of the podocytes, the face podocytes, as well as as vesicular or punctate structures that appear to be clustered in some cases. And then finally, on the right, you can see that um, we looked at, um, we also identified some patients with minimal change disease, obviously, that did not have evidence of antibodies um, in the tissue or in the serum. And all those that had no evidence of, um, of antibodies in the serum, um, in the tissue, I'm sorry, um, were also negative for circulating antinephrine antibodies. And those controls included not only patients with minimal change disease that had no um, IgG in the biopsy, but also um, patients with nephrotic syndrome or nephrotic range proteinuria and a variety of different conditions, including amyloidosis, including uh, diabetic nephropathy and membranous nephropathy. Um, so I think that's very important to mention that those antibodies appear to be specifically present only in patients with diffuse protocytopathies. Um, and um, we found that all patients um, on which we have had biopsy material available that was positive for IgG on biopsy. Um, um, and we also had serum samples available at the time of active disease. Those patients were also, all of them were positive for circulating antinephrine antibodies. So I think that's very important to mention that we have in this small subset with small numbers, essentially 100% you know, uh, specificity, specificity and sensitivity.
we concluded from this that, that nephrin is apparently the target of circulating autoantibodies um, in at least a subset of patients with minimal change disease, according to our studies. So Astrid, I have two brief questions for you. So one is um, a very technical one. It sounds very um, time consuming to set up to actually produce your own ELISA to test antinephrine antibodies. How long did it take you um, to actually create this antibody and make it work in your laboratory? You mean the ELISA? Um, yeah. yeah, so not that long actually. So building an ELISA is not actually as complicated as you would think. Um, so what was the most time consuming part of this was to generate a very clean um, target protein to use for this ELISA that we were coupling to the ELISA plate. The problem that, that nephrin has and had in the past and had created problems for a lot of researchers is that it tends to dimerize because, because it is a protein that dimerizes with itself. As you know, you know uh, nephrin molecules from opposing or adjacent protocytes interact with one another. And this ability to dimerize creates huge issues for purification of this protein when you generate it in, as we did, uh, hex cells. Um, and you have to go through a series of purification steps, including chromatography, et cetera, to really make an as pure as possible um, fraction of nephrin that has nothing else bound to it and also doesn't interact with itself, you know, polymerizes, because that will uh, effectively destroy the ability of this assay to work, as we think that also the antibody potentially and probably binds to the fraction of nephrin that actually interacts with the opposing nephrin molecule, breaking that connection apart. So that really influences the ability to do this, um, this ELISA or use this ELISA um, efficiently. So that, that was the most time consuming part. Everything else, once we had that figured out and had a pure um, nephrin protein or extracellular domain protein available to us and sufficient quantities of it, um, the rest of it was really pretty easy to do. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds fantastic. So my next point is basically the immunofluorescence. And uh, I think you have spoken a lot about that on the NEF Journal Club um, recently in the podcast, um, how you identified actually um, the culprit molecule, let's say, and that Professor Renke has described this punctate IgG for, for decades, but nobody picked, picked it up on a scientific way. So how did you come across nephrine as your let's say, target here. Yeah, so, so the interesting thing about this is my interest in this has, is dating back quite a long time before we even like did in any of these circulating antibody studies. It is actually, I became interested in it when, when I was a fellow in Dr. Renke's um, uh, program here as a renal pathology fellow, because I was always kind of curious what this punctate IgG staining means, because it seemed to be incredibly specific for minimal change disease. You literally do not see that in any other condition, except some cases of early primary FSGS um, and um, some patients with recurrent FSGS in the allograft. And so um, it was very specific. And we could basically say when, when we saw the immunofluorescent staining, we could already tell, okay, this patient must have uh, a diffuse photocytopathy. Um, if we also had the history of nephrotic syndrome, we were already almost 100% confident we would see diffuse foot process effacement um, in, in the EM sample. And so, um, what I also did when I was, um, after my fellowship, I did research for a while and um, was a junior attending and had a grant where we tried to uh, implement super resolution imaging in, um, in the diagnostic pipeline and also in the just uh, as a research tool to look at um, protein localization in renal biopsies. And so I took one of those um, those samples we had from a patient with minimal change disease, and we looked at it using super resolution imaging. And it appeared to me that in that high resolution, it followed the slit diaphragm. You know, I could, I could tell, I could see that round noodle pattern that you see in, in that middle image here in, in this slide. Um, and I was like, wow, this antibody is not only just punctate IgG, it also shows an association with the slit diaphragm in some cases. And that really made me wonder, 
if it was an antibody that binds to a slip diaphragm con, con, uh, component. And so that, that really kind of sparked my interest in this, in this whole um, project, also because I was always fascinated by protocytes and proteinuric kidney diseases and their pathogenesis. And I grew up kind of in Peter Mundell's lab um, as a PhD student. And also uh, later on, I went back to his lab and did some studies. So I was very familiar with the protocyte and, and all these diseases. And so I really became interested in this then, because then I went back to Helmut and I said, Helmut, look at this. This looks like it's maybe binding to a slit diaphragm protein. And then I, I started looking at the literature about junctional protein complexes and antibody mediated diseases in these, in these diseases. And what I came across was pemphigus vulgaris. Pemphigus is actually a very similar disease um, from a lot of standpoints, because it is it is uh, caused by an antibody against the desmosomal component. So as you know, just like a slit diaphragm, the desmosome is a junctional complex and desmosomes, re uh, desmal glands reach out into um, the intercellular space and connect with each other. And the antibody binds um, to a region where those antibodies, um, uh, sorry, those proteins connect with each other and disrupts the connection. And then that protein antibody antigen uh, complex is being taken up by the keratinocyte. And so I was fascinated by this and they looked at this also by super resolution imaging. And then I kind of had the idea that maybe this could be nephrin. Nephrin could be the target. And that's really what sparked the entire project. And I had um, my, my postdoc, Andy Watts, and my uh, technician, a very talented young scientist called Keith Keller, who's actually the second senior author of, on this paper. He always tends to get forgotten because he's second on it, but he actually made quite substantial contributions, including all the imaging for this paper. Um, he These guys came into my office, and we basically had a patient with minimal change disease um, that we saw here and bi whose biopsy we had available and we collected the serum sample. I just ran down to the lab and grabbed a bit, a bit of the serum from a blood draw from that day. And we took human glomerular extract, ran that on a Western blot and just drew the diluted serum on top of it and incubated that blot. And he ran into my office in the next morning and showed me the blood and there was one band <laughs> and it was the size of nephrine. And we all, it was the eureka moment. We all cheered in this office <laughs> and we're like, this can't be true. We really found, you know, the target of, of this autoantibody. And that's when, when it all started. Um, may I also ask you, um, it's a kind of a psychological question um, because we all learned in medical school, there's a T cell permeability factor. And some years ago, um, when I tried to, um, treat patients that were corticosteroid relapses or res resistant. Um, I tried Reduximab because some told me, hey, we have one or two cases here that responded and it responded phenomenally. And when I tried to understand why the hell with a T-cell permeability factor should Reduximab work, there were all kinds of really weird theories um, how Reduximab works. So the, the question is the psychological one. Why your, your paper is a revolution for me. Uh, it's clear, it's concise. I see no any paradox. Maybe there's a hidden one. I don't recognize it. Um, why wasn't uh, this discovered 10 years ago or <laughs> 15 years ago? N -n 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 just it's, it's, it's surprisingly easy and um, I mean, it's a ton of work of you, for co of course, but it's a, such a clear and, 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 and fabulous work. So was this a, a neglect or um, a cognitive bias of the community? Or... Because for me, it was minimal change was somehow a no change disease. I didn't see anything <laughs> on the, on the um, histology except for the electron microscopy. Then there was this paradox with this rituximab and th 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 that's it. Yeah. Well, I think it's a combination of things. Um, cognitive, cognitive bias definitely plays a role, especially in pathology. Uh, pathologists are incredibly good at ignoring things that they can't explain, right? So as it turns out, everybody saw this, this dusting, even though they were laughing at Dr. Rinke at conferences when he mentioned it, you know? And we're kind of dismissing it as some nonspecific, you know, 
thing, you know, phenomenon in the biopsy, everybody saw it. And, and that's really interesting when now, you know, hindsight is 2020, everybody's like, oh, yes, I've always wondered what this means, but nobody ever mentioned it to anybody. And I think that's one problem that we had in, in the field. And then the, the other big issue is agenda driven research that is not based on translational research studies. And this is why I personally, you know, went from being a basic scientist, cell biologist, studying protocyte uh, biology and pathobiology, and then trying to find a link to renal, to, to renal diseases from looking at renal diseases and then go back to figure out what it means. And I think that's, that's one big problem we have in, in not only protocyte biology, not only nephrology research, but in all of research that people tend to focus on their little niche and ignore everything else. And um, that is a big problem I think we have. And I think that that's what's prevented this to be studied. And people have come incredibly close. If you read Virginia Seven's paper on recurrent FSGS, right? She already identified that this was an immunoglobulin-like protein. It was 50 kilodalton. Why was it 50 kilodalton? Because she only probably um, recognized the, the, the heavy chain of it, right? but it was purified through a protein A column that binds IgG. It was very clear when you now read that paper that she found that circulating immunoglobulin. She just didn't do the next step. It just, because she was, you know, it, it just was not considered to be a possibility because of the negative um, EM findings, no immune complex deposition, you know, that, that was something that people couldn't, couldn't conceive that there might be an etiology of an autoimmune phenomenon in the kidney that is not an immune complex deposition disease. And I think that was another thing that they couldn't get it together that there could be IgG staining, but no immune complexes. And that's, that's something that, that's really hard for people to understand still to this date. And a lot of people make these parallels with membranous nephropathy, which is a completely different pathogenesis, you know, that is not the same pathogenesis. And I think looking outside your field is sometimes very helpful. And I think that I found that paper about pemphigus was my aha moment when I was like, okay, there are actually autoimmune diseases that are not, that are not immune complex deposition diseases, you know? And I think we need to get away from this thinking in renal pathology and also in nephrology that there are autoantibody driven diseases. And the transplant nephrologists know that much better than we do because they, you know, deal with autoantibody, functional autoantibody interferences much more than, than we do in, in conventional or you do in conventional nephrology. So I also learned that this is somehow a pemphigus of the kidney. This brings me to my second question. You, you, you mentioned FSGS, and I hate this disease because the patients are really suffering. We do not have specific kinds of therapy. We heavily immunosuppress them without any targets. And now I get a glimpse of hope when you say there is the possibility that it, indeed the minimal change could be the good brother, as we always teach, of the evil uh, FSGS, um, do you think, and if so, in, in which kind of percentage, that maybe this is a kind of more furious autoimmune attack also directed against nephrin? And if so, are there any um, studies, basic or translational studies going on in the FSGS field uh, based upon your findings? So, um, first of all, I think uh, we, the problem that FSGS, the term FSGS has, it's a problematic term for a disease anyway, because it is not a disease, it's a pattern of injury, and it's a late stage pattern of injury. It actually means that you've already lost podocytes and you're now starting to uh, have a sclerotic reaction in, in the glomerulus, right? So that is, that is very important to keep in mind, that this is a stopgap title at the time of a patient who presents, get, gets biopsied at that time and has sclerotic scars in the kidney. So you cannot start out with a scar, right? You, everybody knows that before you get a star, scar, you need the injury. And the initial injury could be preceding um, the scarring um, by years, months, weeks, or days, right? 
So I think this is how, how I see this, that, you know, you cannot just say this patient has minimal change disease and this patient has primary FSGS. Um, it's probably, in my view, the same process that initiated this, these patients' diseases, if we talk about a diffuse photocytopathy with diffuse photocyte injury. This is very different from secondary FSGS due to, you know, obesity and, um, you know, uh, other disease processes in the kidney that lead to scarring. So I think we need to keep that in mind, um, that you cannot start out with scarring. So something has to happen to those photocytes before they uh, get lost in the urine, essentially, or die. And so I think that um, we've been looking at these diseases in a, in a kind of a skewed way um, by trying to separate them into two groups, not knowing anything about their pathogenesis. And that is a big mistake, I think. Um, the problem with studying FSGS patients is that they're already down the road quite far, um, um, some of them. I, you should, you, one should maybe exclude those that are maybe in a tip lesion state of the disease where it's very early on and they still might have evidence of um, circulating autoantibodies or other causative agents, agents in their bodies. But some of those are merely proteinuric at some point because they've lost a substantial number of their protocytes. And I think one has to keep that in mind that patients that have lost that many protocytes will never be completely cured and will never be in complete remission as we define it. Um, so I think you know, what, what gave me the, the spark to think about the, this disease differently are those patients that go th from, M from minimal change disease to FSGS, to end-stage kidney disease, and then recur in the allograft. And that's exactly the patient that we present in this paper. And that's why I pushed for including this one case in this paper, because it's a very illustrative case. It's a, it's a woman who as a child had minimal change disease, clearly di diagnosed on di two different biopsies, then had subsequent biopsies that showed FSGS, clearly progression of the disease, uh, both clinically, but also uh, histologically, then developed end-stage kidney disease, received the kidney transplant and recurred immediately, right? Classic classic case. And we found these antibodies in this patient before the transplant and during the recurrence. And plus, um, which is only really mentioned in that in the supplement of the paper where we just described the clinical history of this patient, this patient had several biopsies as a child that showed FSGS that were read by Dr. Renke, and he described the punctate uh, IgG staining in these biopsies. So this patient clearly had evidence for uh, circulating ne probably nephron antibodies. I don't want to exclude the possibility that there might be other autoantibodies, but there are only so many targets in that little uh, slit diaphragm space. Um, but um, clearly had, had autoantibodies at that time and then had them again or still at the time of recurrence. And I think this is what really sold it to me um, that this is the same disease at least in some patients. And then there are some patients that must have some kind of um, other factor, genetic, environmental, or another circulating factor that will lead to uh, these protocytes not being able to deal as well with this onslaught of antibodies, be it a podosin mutation that will affect trafficking of nephrin back to the surface, be it uh, April 1 in some African uh, patients or patients of African descent that, um, that will prevent the protocytes from recovering from any injury, including antibody-mediated uh, injury, um, or you know, environmental stresses in adult patients more so than in, in children that already have pre-stressed protocytes because they have, you know, uh, they've already lost some because they're obese and they're hypertrophic and they're stretched to the max. Um, those those protocytes will probably not be able to deal with this injury as well as very healthy and normal protocytes. So I think that, you know, one has to think about it this way. Um, there's one initiating disease factor, there are perpetuating factors, and there are factors that will impair discovery, uh, sorry, recovery of the protocytes. Um, and so I think that's, that's how I think of, of FSGS and minimal change disease. They are 
caused potentially by the same initiation, initiating injury, but have a different disease course based on other factors. So finally, um, one of the several $1 million questions that arise from your work is, when can we measure the antinephrine autoantibodies clinically? Huh, hopefully soon. <laughs> We're discussing, um, I'm in discussions with different um, companies and, and clinical entities, um, both in Europe and in the, in the United States that I'm hoping will maybe bring on the ELISA uh, as a clinical test um, in the near future. We can't do that here in my lab. We don't have the capacity. We're not um, you know, credential to do clinical diagnostic testing. Um, so we can only test in a research setting, uh, which I've done for a lot of people, but I cannot really issue an official report, obviously. So, so I'm hoping this will be available soon. Um, I think the applicability of, of this serum assay will be a game changer in a lot of ways. Um, in the pediatric field, obviously, finally, you will be able to potentially provide the parents with the diagnosis in their children without a renal biopsy. Um, and also in the transplant field, I think it will be very important to exclude the presence of nephrine autoantibodies at the time of transplant, especially when you have patients that get uh, living donor um, kidneys, because then you really have time to get the antibody levels down before the kidney goes in. Yeah, also in adult nephrology, so we have some patients on rituximab and we give it right. by gut feeling. So um, once per year or when they get positive in the dipstick in the urine, um, but we have no guidance when to give and, right. and when not to give. And often we see the minimal change in the adults, they, they take a long time um, till there's a, in, in contrast to the, to the um, pediatric mm -hmm. patients. Uh, when there's a resolvement of the nephrotic syndrome uh, of, the, of the proteinuria, is this similar to membranous? So maybe there's a sink of antibodies, autoantibodies in the kidney and when they are absent in the serum or what is going on. And therefore yeah, we so need these antibodies as a guidance. Mm -hmm. And the second kind of thing, maybe an FSGS, when to treat, how to treat and so on. Yeah, in, in right. The, yeah. I, and I think that's going to be very, very important. I mean, you know, the problem is that we can't exclude that there might be other autoantibodies or other circulating factors that might lead to disease in, in some of the patients. You know, in this, in this study, as you see here in this, we found 29% positivity in this cohort. The problem with that cohort, and I can stress, cannot stress that enough, is the Neptune patients are all patients with rather difficult disease courses. There are very few patients that have just, you know, run of the mill, minimal change disease that responds to prednisone because they would probably not enter this, this kind of study. So I think the patients we have were all already pretreated with a combination of immunosuppressive medication, including MMF, cyclosporin, all kinds of things. And you, as you know, you know, it's, it's incredibly heterogeneous how these patients are being treated in different centers. So because those are patients coming from different centers within North America, um, they, they received you know, everything under the sun, <laughs> including prednisone before they even entered the study. And so I think what we have is a, a confounding effect here in, in the Neptune cohort, uh, where we see only 30% positivity in, in active you know, proteinuric patients because some of them have already been pretreated and the antibody is probably already depressed below our detection limit. So, you know, this, this made it a little more difficult to sell this. But what I can tell you is from the biopsy perspective, now that we are aware of it, we see this, this punctate staining for, for IgG in, you know, I would say over 90% of minimal change disease patients. So I think this, the, the true number of people with nephronata antibodies circulating is much higher than 30%. Do you think from the effector mechanism, it's simply an attachment to nephrine and thereby a sterical change of the protocyte behavior because there's maybe no involvement of other immune cells or complement? Um, so how do they affect the integrity of the slit style frag fragment? So I can only speculate about this because I don't obviously have the answer yet for this. We're trying to 
you know, put some studies together to kind of address this. But what I believe based on things that were published in the past uh, were shared with me by other researchers working in, in the nephron field is that it's most likely um, that the nephron autoantibodies disrupt the connection between the cross-linking nephron molecules. Um, the two coming from the two adjacent podocytes, thereby opening up the filtration slit um, and disrupting it. And then secondarily leading to effects that are, you know, caused by outside in signaling, potentially through phosphorylation changes of nephrin uh, and some kind of, you know, clustering of nephrin molecules through the antibodies um, on the cell surface that then lead to, for example, a breakdown of the actin cytoskeleton and foot process effacement. Um, but also to some other structural um, changes in protocytes, in protocyte foot processes. So I think what you get in, in this unique disease is you, you not only have a disruption of the cell cell junction as we see in pemphigus, you also have a structural uh, downstream effect on the protocyte cytoskeleton. Um, so that you have both the foot process effacement with the break breakdown of the actin cytoskeleton, which is rapid and, diff and diffuse, as well as a diffuse breakdown of the slit diaphragm complex. And that's, those are the two things you need to develop nephrotic syndrome. You won't get nephrotic syndrome if you just have foot process effacement, or if you just have a break breakdown of, of some of the, the nephrine, uh, the slit diaphragm complexes, which you can get secondarily in membranous nephropathy as well down the road. Um, but I think that it's a very unique disease in that it, it has both the the functional interference at the level of the slit diaphragm, as well as the downstream effects most likely in the cell itself. I understand that you don't really like the comparison with membranous GM, but nonetheless, if we look into the future, so say in three years, four years or so, when we have this test available in clinical practice, I guess we will see the same discussion that we see now with membranous GN. Should we go for biopsy to each and every adult patient who comes with nephrotic syndrome and has a positive antibody test? Or can we really focus biopsy then on patients who, don't, who do not really have this typical clinical picture then? That's a lot of future speculation. You know, I think that ha that also depends on what we find in prospective analysis. I mean, these are, as I said, this is an observational study. We don't have all the answers. It's also um, difficult to speculate on these things, not knowing exactly what the mechanism is. Um, I think it could, in some patients, uh, be a way to uh, to eliminate the need for a biopsy because. You know, if you have positive antinephrin antibodies, you know, it's pretty likely that that's most likely the cause for your nephrotic syndrome. But if you're negative for them, it doesn't mean that you never had them. I think that's going to be kind of the crux of the whole thing, because we may see some patients that are already partially treated or have spontaneous recovery, which does happen, you know, rarely, but it, it is something that's described and we've seen it. Um, so I think that... Um, you know, it's going to be difficult to speculate on that, uh, on that thing. What, what is different from membranous nephropathy is that uh, it is a very clear cut association of the antibodies with nephrotic syndrome and absence of the antibodies in remission. Uh, in membranous nephropathy, you have buildup of immune, large immune complex deposits, then you know, mechanically displace the protocytes from the glomerular basement membrane and secondarily affect the slit diaphragm structure and function because any little change that you do to the protocyte foot process will affect all the other compartments. So changes to the protocyte adhesion, for example, in Alport syndrome will also lead to proteinuria down the road in many patients because it also affects protocyte integrity, slit diaphragm signaling, all these things. If you have primary mutations in the actin cytoskeleton binding protein, such as actin and 4 um, mutations that leads to familial forms of protocytopathies and FSGS, it also affects, you know, slit diaphragm uh, integrity and adhesion of, of the protocytes to the GBM. 
and vice versa, if you have changes to the flip diaphragm, it will affect the other compartments as well. Um, so I think that what's different from membranous is in membranous, you have the slow buildup of these antigen antibody complexes that lead to a mechanical displacement of the protocyte and then a secondary, secondary breakdown of the slip diaphragm. And these antibody, antibody comp, antigen complexes are not going anywhere. They're gonna stay there for a long time and causing you know, havoc to the, to, to the protocyte. Um, so you can be antibody negative in the serum, but you can be positive for PLA2R and, uh, and IgG in the biopsy. I don't think we're gonna see that much in this disease, minimal change disease, because it is such a rapid process, a rapid disease onset, and also a rapid recovery, you know, that I think if we're going to see a pretty big, pretty good correlation between the IgG and the biopsy and the nephrotic syndrome in the patient as well, and the presence of antibodies in really pure minimal change disease patients that don't have other confounders. Um, we have seen, I've, we've looked at some patients prospectively a little bit, looking at how their antibody levels actually kind of uh, behave. Um, and we had one patient who actually had tip lesions in the primary biopsy, had um, uh, nephrotic syndrome, acute onset nephrotic syndrome, but had it for you know probably a couple of months before he presented, which is often a problem with adult patients. They walk around with this or they get misdiagnosed. They, they get diagnosed as having cardiac failure or something before they show up to the nephrologist months later. And so we don't have that as much as in kids because parents are usually very concerned and take them to the doctor right away when they swell up. And I think that um, uh, these, these patients present often later. And um, so we had one, one uh, male, a uh, young man who had this presentation of acute nephrotic syndrome, had tip lesions on the, on the biopsy already, still had the punctate IgG staining because it was still relatively acute with acute nephrotic syndrome. And then um, was treated with prednisone. And over time, the antibody level slowly went down. And we followed him with multiple samples and we actually had this patient, uh, it was an abstract at the uh, ASN, no, it was, was it ASN? I think it was the ASN meeting a year ago, but we had this abstract um, where the patient really, um, um, no, it was last year, actually. It was the last meeting. <laughs> Sorry, everything blurs with COVID. And my, my perception of time is different. But this patient, um, went into a partial remission and had very low antibody levels compared to the, the first sample we took at the time of the biopsy, and then went into full remission eventually and has no longer any detectable antibody levels. And the same is true from, for the transplant patient um, that we described in the paper that, you know, all, over time, the antibody levels were reduced because of successful treatment to this patient. And then in the end, uh, she went into complete remission and has been ever since. It's, I think it's been two years now for her. And so she's one of the lucky ones who responded very well and was aggressively treated in the first place. And so she had uh, no detectable levels for, um, for antinephrine antibodies eventually after a year. So I think that um, we can use those antibodies kind of as a, a marker, but you know, it, it's probably going to be very clear that, that um, there are some patients that might initially be positive for the antibodies and then the antibody goes away, but they don't fully recover. Those are probably the patients that will go on to develop FSGS. That's going to, that's my personal prediction because those are the patients that have lost protocytes that have been less able to cope with this injury. And then, you know, you will develop FSGS eventually. It's a, it's a very interesting thing, but I think we need more prospective studies to really make a clear, you know, uh, recommendations how this antibody as a biomarker should be used in these patients. Mm. Sorry for being persistent, but I would like to come back one last time to this comparison with membranous GN. Yeah. So here we had this landmark paper with the first description of the PLAR antibody and then came the second antibody and the third antibody and the fourth antibody. Do you expect the same to happen here or do you rather consider that this antibody will be 
the one we will find in future trials and there will be no second and third and fourth one? <laughs> well, there are only so many targets um, that are extra, they have to be extracellular because of the rapidity of the onset. So think of it as a, I always picture this as an in, in vivo IP or somebody said an in vivo chromatography column where you have exposed antigen on the outside and the antibody goes through because IgG is filtered freely, right? So it, it hits the antigen, it causes the problem, the antibodies go down, the patient recovers. Um, so I think there are only so many targets. I mean, we know about nephrin, we know about nef one, two, three. Um, these are three other nephrin analogs, um, which I predict that probably an anti-nephrin antibody or an anti-nef one, two, three antibody will probably also bind to nephrin. So it's probably not a very different, it doesn't make a huge difference probably in terms of the phenotype, but it is possible that NEF123 are other targets. And then there might be some other targets uh, that are not yet found. I don't believe that intracellular proteins could be a target of this um, and cause this rapid onset and rapid recovery um, of this disease as we know it. So I think it'd be limited to a few more proteins, if so, um, but I, I don't believe we'll find a lot of other targets. So my final question actually goes to each of you, because now that we have these findings, when will we start to rediscuss our treatment approaches? So is it still appropriate to go with steroids as first and second and third line treatment, or should we use rituximab or other B cell targets earlier? Surely again, this is something nobody has a final answer for the time being, but I would just be happy to learn about your ideas on that. So if I can pick up that one, I think um, it's very plausible to go with rituximab as first line treatment with minimal steroid exposure. And there is a, a trial in, in France and Paris run by Professor Vincent Odard called Riffy Rhines, studying actually patients once achieving remission, uh, randomized to reduximab versus, versus steroids as a revision maintenance therapy. I think that's the way to go, minimal steroid exposure, minimizing um, all the bad things we're doing to our patients, giving them very high doses of steroids, and then try rituximab. If patients have a minimal lesion, let's say on kidney biopsy, as Espit has already mentioned, um, because in FSGS sense, and that's again, arguing that this is a continuous process, uh, rituximab is not working that well, but has mainly been used as a third, fourth line uh, immunosuppressant. So when patients actually already established their kidney lesion and, and don't really show any resolution. I think in, in pure minimal change disease or minimal uh, polycytic injury, I think it's a wonder drug and should be used upfront. But then of course, like in the UK, you don't get the permission to treat because it's more expensive than steroids. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's also the, the con conception that, that I tend to have now knowing all this about these antibodies that I think it's very important to treat early on. Um, and, and I think we tend to wait too long with rituximab. I think that, you know, and I'm not a nephrologist, but I think that you, you wait until the patient is really not responding to steroids and things like that, but then it's probably no longer autoantibody mediated. So it's not surprising to me that in FSGS patients who have been treated with prednisone for a long time, that rituximab will no longer work unless they have an acute relapse, right? Then it's something to consider. And I think that's where it's most commonly used um, at this point. But, but I think when you talk about minimal change disease patients and you really want to treat this effectively with rituximab, you got to get the, the B cells down as fast as possible so they stop producing. And also to prevent the formation of memory cells, right? Because then it... it, it essentially is cured. Um, I think the discussion is different with children. So there the steroids were fantastic. And if there would be a relapse, right. maybe one could consider it. Um, in my clinical experience, 
adults often take two, three months before they respond clinically. And this is a long time to, to take high dose steroids. And yeah, I yeah. think a specific B cell therapy would be an advantage, a real advantage. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And also don't, let's not forget the side effects of rituximab, right? Especially now in the age of COVID and COVID vaccinations. I mean, mm. we've had a lot of patients here that, that received rituximab and, and they could not be successfully vaccinated and then had to be taken off rituximab in order to build, you know, a significant antibody response to the COVID vaccine. So those are things to consider, I think, um, also yeah. with with rituximab, although steroids probably aren't great for that either. So thanks a lot. This was very, very interesting and we're <laughs> fascinating to learn these novel approaches. We're very happy that so many smart researchers from Germany, from Austria and the States and do all this work that will definitely change the way we diagnose and we treat our patients in the, I guess, not so far future. We wish you a very pleasant afternoon, evening in Massachusetts. We are aware of your very attractive leisure time options you have at the East Coast. And for all of our colleagues who are eager to learn more about that, we again would like to refer to the recent NAFOJC talk. So thanks again, Astrid. Looking forward to meeting you one day in the future. Just we'll see. I, I hope that other groups are going to pick this up as well, who have much better infrastructure and maybe more money than I do. <laughs>